Okay, hello and welcome. I'm Jason Gumpert from MSDynamicsWorld.com, and we're here for a new session in our Fall 2015 Financial Automation Event Series. Today I'm happy to welcome a returning speaker for us, Blair Hurlbut. Blair is the ERP team lead at Catapult, where he works with customers deploying Dynamics NAV, Serenic, and Acumatica, and it's great to have him back today. Before we get started, I'd also like to recognize our Financial Automation Series sponsors and thank them for their support of msdynamicsworld.com. They are Perceptive Software, Metafile, Esker, Docstar, and Avalara. So as we get started, please know that you can use the Q&A block uh, or the chat that you'll see to the right side of the webcast session here to ask questions and provide your thoughts. Uh, we'll also have a few poll questions for you throughout the day, so please do pay attention for those. They'll help, uh, they'll help our speaker, Blair, um, uh, understand uh, the audience a little bit better. And uh, without further delay, Blair, let me hand it off to you. Thanks, Jason. Good morning, everybody. Hope you guys are having a, a great Tuesday. Uh, I'm just going to flip over into to my slides uh, regarding the month end. And before we get into that, I was just going to, to give a, a brief introduction uh, of myself uh, and the company that I work for, Catapult. Um, so we are a dynamic and uh, Acumatica partner uh, located in Vancouver. Uh, we focus on implementations. Uh, we also do a lot of focus on our managed services and business improvement side of things. Uh, we have a lot of clients who focus on long-term support, uh, and actually I'm, I'm pretty glad to see that we actually have two of our clients on, on the call today. So thank you guys for, for popping on, and it's great to see uh, people uh, attending these types of sessions to learn more about MAV and continue to, to grow the product itself. Um, one of the things that we do here at Catapult, um, uh, I think we do it very well as our managed services in keeping in contact with our customers on a monthly basis. Uh, I, I've done a couple of these speaking, uh, speaking engagements where uh, as, as soon as I say when we talk to our client on a monthly basis, you can kind of see people's jaws drop because they don't talk to their NAV partners enough. Um, and, and I think we do a great job of communicating back with our, our clients and making sure that we're abreast of what's going on in their business. Um, and one of the reasons I'm uh, talking about that a little bit is that whenever you um, talk about changing businesses, um, those types of things can really impact your month end or year end process. And that's what we're here to talk about today is where do you guys sit in the uh, month end uh, maturity matrix that we've built and how can you guys improve and build upon what you're doing today to sort of become masters and, and be able to, to really clean up uh, your month end side of things. We're also going to have some polls that I'm going to ask you guys to uh, fill out as we're going through today, uh, and Jason will, will pop those up and keep those open as uh, we're going through here. So we'll actually start off with the, the first poll question that I had here today was, how many of you guys um, have a, a month end checklist right now? So if you guys can go into the right-hand side of your, your WebEx session here and tell me, do you currently have an actual checklist that you make sure that you go through uh, when you're going into your month-end process? So All right. the reason, so it, it should be popped up here on the right-hand side. I can now see it on mine. We'll give about five more seconds and then we'll close this one out, Blair. Okay. And Jason, are you able to see as people are responding that you're getting responses to these? Yeah, and I can I can give you the sort of before I can display the results here. I can tell you it's um, about uh, fifty percent say yes and twenty percent say no, and then uh, about twenty percent didn't answer. Okay. Okay. So may, maybe that that last little bit didn't know <laughs> whether or not they have a checklist. Um, so. When we're talking about your, your month end, um, the, the reason that it is so important is that typically uh, it, if you need to, to produce any managerial reports to make business decisions, if you need to create board reports, that type of thing, you need to have a checklist to know um, all of the steps that you need to go through uh, at, the, at your month end process 
because if you leave out very specific items in your month-end process, as some of you guys might know, it can have some impacts later on. Um, uh, more likely, it'll have impacts when you come up to your year-end process, okay? So, and some of the impacts or reasons that you can have some, some inconsistency in your month-end process is maybe your business has changed drastically, um, maybe you have a lot of sales or a lot of um, uh, payables or receivables coming in at the end of the month because your business model has changed slightly, or maybe you've had some turnover um, uh, of some key staff. I know some of my clients recently have gone through this where um, they had a key individual who was responsible for looking after their month-end process, uh, but if that person leaves, then there's a gap in knowledge at this point in time of, well, what steps was that person doing and how do we recreate those, um, those month-end uh, uh, procedures. So what we're going to go through today is uh, I just gave you guys a little agenda here. Uh, we're going to look at the, the month-end maturity uh, model that uh, I've created. Again, it's just my opinion of kind of where you would sit within this model. Uh, to give you guys a, a representation of uh, where you are and, and what you can improve upon moving forward, okay? And then we'll go into some of the best practices around these uh, functional areas at this point in time to ensure that you guys are running through these procedures to make sure that your month end is going to go a little bit more seamless and make it a little bit more enjoyable for the folks in finance. Okay. Hopped over a slide there. Excuse me. So this is the maturity uh, model that that we've come up with here at Catapult. And so you see, it's really it's just broken up into three groupings. Either there's a, a low maturity uh, type of client, and uh, so this is the type of client who who doesn't leverage some of the out of the box functionality within NAP to limit user posting dates, um, to control what period people are posting within. Um, typically, these clients leave uh, journals open at the month-end process that possibly should have been processed in the previous month. Um, they may do some reconciliations. They may do, say, their bank reconciliation, but they won't touch any of the uh, AR or AP subledgers until maybe their year-end or, in, in some cases, the horror stories. Uh, where you have a client who's really never closed the books on any period um, and they've been running now for multiple years. And so we typically encounter some of these, we call them more NAB rescues where um, maybe the application is being implemented for the client, um, everyone who was part of that implementation left shortly thereafter, uh, and the, the organization was just kind of left to float and try to get by either by hook or crook or uh, using whatever uh, spreadsheets they could uh, outside of the ERP, outside of NAV, to be able to do their reconciliation. The other thing that you typically find within the sort of lower uh, end of the maturity model is that the reporting practices for, for these types of organizations, it takes them multiple weeks or possibly months to get out managerial reports or financial reports uh, for the bank or uh, for their board if, if applicable. So that's typically where you'll see a, a, a really low uh, maturity model client um, that is using NAV. And so we, we have the horror stories of organizations who allow direct posting to um, their control, account, control accounts. So for example, um, we had one client who just allowed a, a lot of direct posting to their uh, payables and receivables accounts. So when we came to try to do a reconciliation at their year end because they were looking for um, some additional financing from the bank, but the bank wanted to see an audited set of financial statements, we needed to start doing uh, recs against all of their subledgers. So all of the posting groups that they had set up for both their AR and AP didn't balance. So it becomes a large exercise to go back through and figure out, well, why were people posting directly to the GL accounts? Because you should always be posting either directly to a customer account or to a vendor account, never to the control account, which sits in the chart of accounts and is tied in via the posting group. So this is the type of thing that we would see all the time with our NAV rescues, as we call them. And they really are some kind of horror stories and 
we always tell this to, to our clients, don't go down this path um, because you know, you'll, you'll be the horror story either with us at a year end or a month end or whenever you get audited or if you go to another partner, that partner is going to have the same, same issue trying to reconcile everything. The next step into the maturity model is the medium um, type of client. And, and I find that probably 80% of, of clients actually sit in the uh, medium area of the maturity model. So they close their uh, periods, um, they post all of their open journals, they complete their reconciliations, they do their, their uh, currency adjustments, their exchange rate adjustments, and they have some pretty good reporting, okay? But there's uh, a lot of different steps that they're probably missing out either on a monthly basis or maybe they do some of these on a, on a, a more annual basis. Um, but typically to move from the medium to high area in the maturity model, um, as you can see in the high model, uh, doing any stale checks, um, ensuring that you're, you're reissuing checks if need be or or canceling any stale checks that have been outstanding. There's not a lot of organizations that'll do that, or they might do it on a every six month period. Um, it might not be something they'll do on a on a month to month basis. If there's any bad debt write offs, ensuring that those are getting in on a, a monthly basis so that you can keep uh, your your receivables up to date at that point in time. Uh, one of the new pieces of, of functionality um, in NAP 2015 is there is an auto matching for the bank reconciliation. So lots of people do um, will do the reconciliation manually, but as you get into credit card processing and that type of thing, uh, it can be kind of an arduous process. And a lot of organizations, um, even if they fall into the, the medium area, they might not be actually be using the out-of-the-box functionality for some of the bank reconciliation. They might still take it offline just because of the volume of transactions and the ability to leverage some Excel type functions to help with their reconciliation process. Um, some people in the high model also, instead of having the auto matching feature, which is just new, uh, if you're on an older version than, than uh, 2015, you may have a customization to pull in your bank statement and do some of this auto matching uh, yourself. So uh, we'll, that'll be a poll question later on to see how many of you have a customization for that. Uh, also, just doing your monthly uh, maintenance of your customer and vendors, making sure there's no duplicates, making sure that um, customers and vendors are active in there, that's something that typically falls to the wayside um, when people are going through their month end procedures, uh, especially if you're a small organization that doesn't have a huge accounting team, you might not be going through uh, and doing all of that maintenance on a month to month basis. It might just be, oh, Vendor XYZ has gone into receivership, we should block them in the system so we're no longer doing any purchases against that particular vendor. So to keep up on all of that uh, is something that a, a, a higher maturity model client would actually be going through on a month-to-month -month basis. And then the last one within the, the month-end maturity model is there's pretty timely and accurate uh, reporting. So the people in the in the high maturity model range typically are able to push out their financial uh, statements and reporting to managers uh, within a few days of the close. And it's pretty regimented within those organizations and they do a pretty good job of, of getting through uh, all of those. So, if Jason, if you could pull up the second poll question, and that's just really asking you guys, where, where do you feel you fall right now within this maturity model? Just with that brief overview uh, uh, of the model uh, and based on what you guys know about your current uh, internal practices. <clears throat> All right, so that is starting to get some answers. Uh, I'll give that another, let's say, 10 seconds here. Looks like we got all the, we collected what we can here. Okay. Perfect. All right, there you go. Yeah, so so of the entire group of, of 23 people, uh, only one person answered that they, they feel that they're in a high, uh, high area of the maturity model. Uh, and the, 
remainder, the majority fell into the medium, and then a couple of them fell into the low. So kind of what I expect to see within the maturity model, and, and really for most people, is how do we get from, from the medium up to the high? So I'm going to go over some of the best practices now of what you should be doing within, uh, within NAV. Um, some of these are, are going to be for, for the low-end group, um, but again, it's, it's always nice for, for the people in the medium to high to have a little refresher on some of these items, but I do apologize if, if you feel this is something you're already doing um, uh, incredibly well uh, and running through uh, in, your, uh, in your system and in your practices today. So some of the best practices around the general ledger themselves is posting of any open journals uh, and also having any uh, recurring journals that you might have within the application, either standard journals or recurring journals themselves, making sure that those are on your checklist so that you can ensure that you've knocked them off. Um, so I'm sure that the majority of the people uh, on this call have either standard journals saved within NAV that they run on a monthly basis for rent or uh, a, a consistent expense that they're going to have, have incurred, or you might have some accrual that you use the recurring journal to calculate for you uh, and post on the last um, day of the month and then reverse those out on the first day of the following month. So ensuring that those are on your checklist is highly important because you need to make sure that you're getting through um, all of those to, to make sure that your ledger is up to date with all of the postings um, because typically what happens with the low maturity model uh, client who forgets to post their journals, they produce their financial statements or their managerial reports, they look at them and they realize something is missing that is, is quite blatant uh, at this point in time. Okay. So if you aren't posting all of those journals, then you're going to begin to hit some, some uh, questions uh, as you're uh, getting into that type of review of uh, your general ledger at this point in time, okay? So the recurring journal is something that uh, is a little bit unique, of course, within NAV because there's a lot of different ways that you can configure it based on your business need. Um, you can configure it for uh, reversals on the first of the next month, which is a, a, an incredible uh, uh, pro uh, of using that particular item. Uh, using the recurring journal also tells you the last time it was run so that you can um, keep track of, I'm not going to run it twice within one month. Um, I'll run it at the end of uh, my September month or the end of August and then I know I won't have to run it again until the following month. So you can configure the recurring journals to be able to go and set those up. One of the cons of the recurring journals, and, and this is more just a terminology and a philosophy about recurring journals for, for some clients or people that are new to NAV, is that recurring journals don't auto-post at this point in time, okay? It has to be part of your, your checklist and people need to uh, ensure that they go in and run through the periodic activity of posting these particular journals, creating them and posting them. But the recurring journal has uh, uh, an incredible piece of, uh, of functionality built into it. And, and typically I give uh, examples of recurring journals uh, within this type of, type of uh, presentation. And, and a, a good one is just um, your, your, your uh, prepaid insurance on something if you want to accrue uh, accrue that as you're going through the year. You can set that up to look at the balance of a particular account uh, or you can set up a fixed amount over the period and do your accrual and then reverse out the entry on the first day uh, of the next month. So that's just a, a brief real world e example of how some of our clients are using it. Um, sometimes people will use recurring journals if they don't have the fixed asset module set up within NAV and I know uh, when people are typically implementing a ERP system, fixed assets are usually done uh, in an old legacy system or maybe kept in a spreadsheet and never brought into their ERP. So a lot of people will use a recurring journal to bring in uh, that uh, monthly uh, amortization into the GL. So that's another real world example where people are leveraging recurring journals. Okay. Another best practice within the general ledger itself is 
uh, ensuring that you're limiting the users on where they can post within the application. So there's two ways to do this within um, NAV currently. You have on the general ledger setup, and this is the, the first image on the left-hand side where it says general ledger setup. You see that there's two fields called, one called allow posting from, one called uh, allow posting to. How you should leverage NAV today is that you should leverage this for the majority of the users within the application. So your AR and AP administrators, uh, anyone who has access um, to do purchases, receipts, um, that type of functionality. Um, you would set up in here to say, okay, as of now, uh, the allow from posting date should be uh, September 1st. Uh, to the allow to posting date of the end of September. There are examples where clients will put it out till the year end if there's certain items that they want to hit in future months. There's some additional risk of people accidentally posting things out to the future, but some clients are okay with that as they trust their staff to be posting in the correct period. Others have a high turnover of staff and they only want them posting in the current period, which is September right now. So the way that NAV thinks is if I would have filled in each of these fields to have uh, allow posting from and allow posting to, it would take this by default if my user setup, which is the screenshot to the bottom right, has a blank allow from and allow to posting. So you can see in the screenshot right now, this user, which is my user ID, um, has an allow from and posting of June 1st to June 30th. So my particular user, would have their access ignore the general ledger setup and say, okay, Blair can only post to June right now. And maybe I'm doing some cleanup um, back for that month because we found some errors in there and I need to clean that up. So I can limit my access by using the user setup. And the way that you'd want to leverage this in your month end is if you have a, a maybe a, a soft close where you allow that AP, AR, uh, administrators to post until the fourth business day, then you change their allowed to from posting to the next month and you leave the financial accountants and the controllers to be able to do any month-end adjustments back in the previous month. You would put it in here for the few users that can go back into the previous month and I could say, okay, give Blair access from August 1st to the end of December so I could post in two periods if I wanted to at this point in time. But that's more for your senior type of accounting uh, folks within the system. So how many of you, and we can move to the next poll question, Jason, do you guys actually close users out of specific periods? All right, those results are coming in. Give it another five seconds or so. All right, here are the results. Okay, so uh, the majority of you guys uh, answered that yes, you do close out users, but there are some of you guys who, who currently do not close out users, so that's one area where you'll, you'll really see a, a, a drastic improvement in uh, errors because it's very easy for someone to put in, oh, it's, it's September 15th, 2014, or, or when you have those months that, depending on how your date settings are set up in NAV, they can easily flip it back to a, a prior period. And we, we had one client who uh, continuously changed their, their posting dates backwards um, for whatever reason, that because the original document date was back in 2014, so they kept changing it back to 2014, and they kept wondering why all of their uh, numbers kept changing after they had closed the period. It's because they didn't really lock users out of a specific financial period, so they continued on to process sales documents back in a previous period, which obviously becomes a huge nightmare to know how do we clean all of those up, which ones should have been in the current period, uh, et cetera. So it's, it's something that you guys should start to incorporate into your month-end uh, checklist, and it's typically driven by either your senior accountant or controller uh, within your organization that as soon as they hit the third, end of the third business day, they go in there and update the general ledger setup, and they update the uh, um, 
user setup to say, okay, these specific users can go back into, into last month and our administrator type staff can go into the current month only. Okay. So one of the areas um, around the best practices for AR and AP is leveraging working dates. So uh, it doesn't matter which version of NAV you guys are working in, um, if you're working in a classic client environment or a role tailored client, uh, in the role tailored client at the bottom left hand corner you'll see that there's a date, that's your working date. If you click on that it'll bring a dialog box up and you can set that backwards to say last month into August if I was making adjustments and whenever I'm going into either, uh, for example, an AP invoice or a purchase order, if I put a W into the posting date, it'll use that working date to populate any posting date uh, on a document or journal that you're creating. So you can start to use working dates to be able to go back through uh, and ensure that you're posting in the correct periods moving forward. You have to be cautious with that. Um, if you change your work date um, to last month and you close the application, next time you relaunch it, it'll use today's date. But it is a nice little piece of functionality um, that NAV has when you're working within um, your month end process to span essentially different periods of time uh, between months. The scale data checks, um, this is something that, and and excuse the uh, spelling of that for our counterparts down in the United States. I thought I had changed them all to be check or the American way of spelling check versus the Canadian way of spelling check. Um, but ensuring that you're going through to see uh, what stale data checks, so going through the, the bank check ledger entries to see what checks are currently open at this point in time. You can easily set some filters within the uh, check uh, bank check detailed ledger entries uh, and find specific checks that are sitting maybe outstanding. I believe the, the typical best practice is anything that's standing outside of six months to go through uh, and grab those particular checks and either reissue them um, uh, or, or financially void them and, and follow up with any vendors, et cetera. Uh, maybe they've gone out of business, um, go through those practices. The other thing that you want to ensure that you do is you need to run your, your AP and AR reconciliation based on the posting groups. So for your uh, AP side of things, um, you have your aged accounts payable report that you should be breaking down based off of all of the posting groups and all of the GLs associated with those posting groups, okay? So the way that NAV works is that your uh, vendor posting groups Typically, and again, you have to validate this because there's some uh, partners who, who for whatever reason just use uh, posting groups as a way to categorize vendors and invoices. But if you look at your vendor posting group, you should see that each one has a unique control account or GL account associated with it. And so when you run your aged um, payables or receivables report, you'll be tying it back to whatever that GL account is per posting group. So if you have five posting groups and they have five different GLs, you essentially go through five reconciliations. And as you run your um, specific aged uh, payable based on the posting group, you would start to tie that back to the GL. In theory, these two items should stay in balance as long as you have the direct posting off um, within the uh, within the GL accounts themselves. So uh, if you don't allow uh, direct posting, which again you shouldn't for those control accounts, now in theory they should not come out of balance, okay? So if I have uh, in this vendor posting group, we'll say posting group A, I have $100,000 of payables at this point in time, when I run that reconciliation back to the, the report, back to the GL account for that posting group, uh, which would be your accounts payables, we'll say your domestic or, or posting group A GL account, it should also say $100,000 at this point in time. Uh, if there's any discrepancies in there at that point in time, that's when you need to go back and start to drill into all of the entries for that particular GL account. So back to the horror story type, uh, 
uh, customers that if they've never done a reconciliation in a couple of years, they also have direct posting onto that GL account. You can imagine how difficult it is to figure out all of the ins and outs of a payables or receivables GL account to be able to try to do a reconciliation um, back to that. So same thing applies for the AR and the AP. Where the AR is a little bit uh, more unique is that uh, within the uh, accounts receivables, you guys may charge some finance charges for any delinquent accounts. So ensuring that your finance charges are set up and that you have a process to run through to issue all of your finance charges at your month end. And so all of these items that we're talking about in here should all be a part of your checklist when you go forward uh, and ensure that you're knocking these off as you're going through. So maybe you guys charge 2% on accounts over 90 days or 60 days, whatever your criteria is for charging those finance charges, you need to go through the steps within the application to be able to issue those out um, so everything's uh, up to date at that point in time. The next bank rec that, that you guys, or next reconciliation that you guys will be doing is around the bank rec uh, itself. So as I mentioned before, um, there is a new feature within NAV 2015 that does some auto matching within your bank reconciliation module. Uh, you can still run it in the old classic version where you manually tick everything off. But how the bank reconciliation works in NAV 2015 is it allows you to import your statement file coming from your bank account. So you just go online, download your statement to a typically a CSV file or a text file, however your bank passes it to you. Uh, and then from there, you just point NAV to that specific um, file when you're ready to do your bank rec. It'll pull in all of the uh, entries for that uh, bank rec, and then you can set some criteria on how to auto match it. Maybe you have a, a, a clearance of two or three days based on the, the date of the transaction from your statement to your bank account. and um, it also looks at the amount and, and description of each of those items. So if, if the check number comes up and the amount is the same, then it will auto tick those off for you within the bank, uh, bank rec module itself. A lot, of or, a lot of people will actually go in and uh, uh, build customizations if you're not on the newest version of NAV to start to deal with some of these auto matching features, especially if you have a lot of um, transactions on a monthly basis to your bank account. I came from the client side working in Alberta uh, at, at a post-secondary there and we had a lot of food outlets and conference facility type uh, revenue drivers. So we had a ton of credit card um, transactions hitting our bank on a daily basis. So we ended up customizing the system to be able to pull in our statement and do some auto matching based on, on the criteria that we set up. That type of feature is now out of the box. Um, we don't regret doing the customization because it saves us hours and hours upon uh, doing our bank rec on a monthly basis. Um, but it becomes quite a bit uh, uh, of overhead if you're going to maintain a customization like that. And it's great to see it as an out of the box feature now in the newer version of that. Uh, I just have one other poll question around um, the reconciliation of your subledgers, if we can pull that up, Jason. Uh, and really, just asking how many of you guys are, are doing your, oh, sorry, this is, we can put this one up now because we're talking about bank rec. Um, but how many of you guys have actually customized your auto match uh, feature for your bank rec uh, today? Oh, sorry, sorry for the confusion on that, Blair. I can bring up the other one after this if you want. Yeah, we'll bring that up once once we finish talking about the, the last one here. That's fine, Jay. Okay, I'm going to close this one out. Okay. So so one of you guys has a, a customization. I'm not sure who answered that, but uh, I know one of my clients uh, had this customization from a, a, another partner at one point in time. Um, so a couple of you guys have customized this, and, and again, if you're if you're pushing in a ton of transactions in there, uh, it, it definitely makes sense to do that. Uh, one of the other things that you need to ensure that you get in uh, before you do your bank rec or as you're going through your bank rec is you need to put any adjustments uh, for fees um, or, or bank charges or that type of thing 
into uh, the subledger against your bank account uh, before you can complete your bank rec. Um, one of the new features within the um, bank rec in 2015 in NAV is if there's an item that's got pulled in, say a service charge on your bank statement and it doesn't exist in your subledger as of yet, you can actually tick that off and transfer it to uh, a general journal and post that directly against your, your bank account, uh, which is quite a nice little feature that they've, they've added into the bank rec uh, side of things. So you can post up that next question, uh, Jason. Uh, and now that we've gone through some of the subledgers, I just want to see how many of you guys are actually doing this on, on a monthly basis? Are you guys doing your AR or AP bank rec? And for those of you that have inventory and fixed assets, are you also making sure that those balance on a monthly basis? All right, five second warning on this one. And here are those results. So kind of consistent with the, the answers to the other questions. Uh, a couple of you answered no, but the majority answered yes, that you're going through your subledgers and doing this. So that's, that's a great thing to be doing on a, on a monthly basis. And again, that's why you guys, the majority of you guys fall into the medium, uh, medium range on the maturity model. Foreign exchange is something that we get asked about um, quite a bit, and how frequently should we do this? Uh, that's really dependent on the volume of your business. How much business are you doing in foreign currencies? Um, what is the volatility of those current currencies? Is there big up and downs in those? Are you putting yourself and your organization at risk um, by not running the not running through the foreign exchange uh, on a, a monthly? Uh, or weekly or daily basis, that's all entirely up to you to make a decision on. We, we have some clients who deal so little with uh, foreign exchange that they, it's not really a huge issue to them. Um, there's not a ton of risk uh, in them only running this at a month end um, process. Uh, some organizations, if you have uh, employees who are done it, doing a ton of traveling, you might run this a bit more frequently so they get uh, a different exchange rate or you might just have them enter in any expenses at your, your base currency based off of credit card statements or whatever it might be. Um, so it all is dependent on your organization and how often um, you want to do this and the volume of transactions that you're doing. So, and again, we have clients who do it on a weekly basis to a daily basis to clients who do it on a monthly basis. So again, it's entirely up to you guys of how often you want to go through this, but you need to ensure that you've gone through and started to um, do your reconciliations to some of your subledgers before running into your uh, exchange process to make sure that everything is balancing out before you start to, to run any uh, gains or losses on your exchange. Um, the reason that you would typically would like to do that is to make sure that everything's in balance and it helps if there's any issues uh, after you run any, uh, any processes around your, your uh, foreign exchange, just to make sure that everything balanced ahead of time versus guessing where the issue could be. Is there an issue with how you ran the foreign exchange process and how you set up the currencies and the amounts in there, or was the original, uh, was the issue originally that someone's been posting directly to a, a control account and that's why you now have discrepancies between the two, okay? So it, it does have an impact uh, and it's something just to be aware of when you're running through your process um, that you should uh, do your, your subledger reconciliation prior to, to looking at your foreign exchange. The other area that um, you need to go through in, in your uh, month-end process is have you run through the, the amortization of any of your fixed assets? Um, are there any uh, reporting that you need to do on your fixed assets and or any reevaluations or disposals or write-downs that you need to do of your fixed assets? As I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of clients who don't implement the fixed asset module, even though it's a, a, an incredibly well-written module within NAV and it's very straightforward. People just uh, on occasion lose, uh, lose time and energy doing the rest of the financial implementation and they are happy to keep fixed assets uh, within Excel. So are you journaling those in on a monthly basis or are you running them through 
uh, the depreciation amortization process within NAV directly. So you need to make sure that those are, are up to date uh, and you also need to do a reconciliation of your fixed assets uh, on a monthly basis on top of it. But this is an area where sometimes people will keep it, as I said, outside of the application itself. So you'll need to go through and, and do that. Okay. Inventory. Uh, inventory is always something uh, that is unique and different on a client-by-client -client basis. Uh, the reason for that is um, some clients, again, have different types of costing methods and configurations um, to the inventory. Uh, and a lot of the times people will customize some of the inventory or manufacturing processing around this. So this is something that you really need to dig into uh, on a month-to-month -month basis. Um, depending on how you process inventory within NAV at this point in time. Um, we could probably have a session just around uh, inventory costing methods themselves and some of the practices around closing those off. Some people have um, posting of costs directly to the GL account. Other people do it um, through an inventory cost evaluation process that you need to run through at a month end. It all depends on the volume of transactions that your organization has and the number of inventory that you have within NAV. Um, again, are you using FIFO, are you using average costing, are you using standard costing? You need to take all of these items into account when you're running through your month-end process. One thing that you need to do is you need to ensure that you're running through and doing a, a, a sub-ledger again by your posting groups, making sure that your inventory valuation is tying back um, to your GL at this point in time. Again, there are processes that you need to ensure that you run before you uh, do some of those evaluations, but it's all dependent on how you've configured the application at this point in time. Uh, another thing uh, some clients are, are doing more frequently in their month-end processes, but they're bringing in cycle counts opposed to doing just a physical year-end count uh, at, your year, uh, at the end of the year. So we close down inventory for three days, we get our count sheets and we go out and do that. Um, lots of businesses can't afford that time to be down, so they start doing cycle counts. They'll grab this group of inventory uh, in this month end and they'll continue to do that uh, until they do a, a cycle count of all their inventory and they can do their adjustments either positively or negatively based on that inventory uh, that's sitting on the shelves uh, at this point in time. So that's one thing that you typically see a, a high maturity um, model organization doing versus a low maturity model. And I know not everyone uh, probably uses inventory, um, so that's why I don't mention it a ton in the maturity model itself, um, but this is something that a more mature organization is going to be doing. They're going to have their cycle counts, they're going to have a plan at the beginning of the year to get through their 10,000 items throughout the 12 months versus doing it all at uh, year end. Okay. So as I had asked you guys earlier, where do you guys land and how are you guys going to look to improve some of this? So depending on where you sit in here, if you're sitting in the low area of the maturity model, obviously there's some pretty uh, obvious items that you can start doing. Going through all your journal batches, making sure that those are all posted closing off your posting dates for users so that you're not posting into closed months at this point in time, making sure you get through all your reconciliations on a monthly basis. Some of the benefits of that is as soon as you start to build this checklist and start to put some of those practices in, you're going to see some of the errors and issues that you're having within your GL and subledgers are going to start to go away because you're going to reconcile them on a monthly basis. You're going to make sure people aren't posting backwards uh, into closed periods so that your reporting is going to be accurate and you're going to be able to start to produce your reports in a more timely manner. You're going to get out of this horror story type uh, level of maturity and you're going to get into the medium or more stable um, area of the maturity model. So if you're in the medium side of things, what are some of the things that you can do moving forward? Obviously going through and doing some maintenance of some of your uh, customers and vendors. Um, uh, would be a, a, a nice start. If you have any of the auto matching type features or if you're planning an upgrade, you could start to incorporate those into your upgrade to be able to use those in 2015. You can also ensure that you're doing your, your bad debt write-offs and going through and, and building a process for reviewing all of your outstanding checks 
in deciding on how to manage those moving forward. Okay? If you have inventory, um, again, coming up with cycle counts and putting those into practice, um, that would be a, a, a nice piece to put into uh, your month-end procedures and making sure that people have availability to do those on a monthly basis. And again, the benefits of doing these are there's going to be less questions from auditors if, if you're an organization that gets audited. You're going to have better reporting. You're probably going to have more accurate financial information because you're going to have a better fundamental understanding of all the steps you need to go through to get to your month-end to that final set of numbers to produce those financial statements. It's probably also going to help with the majority of your year-end process too because it won't be as arduous of a task if you're doing your, all of your reconciliations for 12 months in, the, in your year-end, then obviously you're going to spread that out, that workload out throughout the year uh, and you'll only really, if you've done 11 months of reconciliations, you just have one month left to do your reconciliations and it'll start to clean up your year-end process uh, as you're going through. So that's essentially it for me and I can see that there's been some kind of Q&A questions coming in or some chat questions coming in uh, as we're going through here. Um, so one person asked, where do we click to open this role center? So um, if you're asking about a, a, a role center, um, more than likely you're probably, and this was from Sheila, you're probably sitting on, uh, uh, you're probably actually using the, the classic client of of Navision versus the role tailored client. Um, if you're on a, a version of 2000, either earlier than 2009, you could be on a, a, a classic version and, and you won't have a role center um, to, to open up the, when you open up your role tailored client. All right, and there are several other questions there, uh, Blair, in the Q&A. Yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to scroll through some of them. Okay, great. Or is she on, oh, so on, on financial reporting. So, so what are some of the issues that you guys are, are uh, hitting with your financial reporting? Um, I, without having very specifics here, um, typically uh, with financial reporting, most organizations are, are using a third-party application, be it like Jet Report um, or uh, BI Solver. So as I see, the, the NAV internal reporting sucks, which I, I will be very honest with you, it's, it's at times uh, uh, embarrassing of how poorly the internal uh, product is at doing some reports. Depending on what version of NAV you're in, um, there are some capabilities just around uh, uh, in the newer versions of the role tailored client from 2013 to 2015, um, a lot of the reports that people used to push out via um, uh, NAV reports um, can be done just using uh, filtering within the application. But if you're looking to get into complex reporting around some of the subledgers, it's typically recommended to make an investment in something like Jet Essentials or look at BI Solver and their reporting uh, tools. Uh, uh, I think <laughs> FRX, um, I don't know anyone using uh, FRX anymore. Um, some people will use SQL reporting services if they have in-house expertise for it. But again, trying to find that person with the expertise or paying a partner to build those reports can become more complex. Uh, I would suggest looking at something like Jet Essentials where it's built into uh, Excel itself and have hooks into the NAV database, same with BI Solver and their product. It already knows the data layout within NAV uh, and it's easier for the application to be able to uh, pull in the data for you. There's a little bit of training for the uh, accounting or advanced Excel people to know how to use the, the tools within each of those um, reporting options, but they're incredibly powerful and I would say Probably 80 to 90 percent of our clients are, are using JET, uh, either Essentials or even Express, if, um, which is a free version that you can get with NAV, uh, I believe it starts in 2009 all the way up to 2015. It comes with your annual license um, of NAV, so if you're 
if you have if you have a newer version of NAV, you already have um, Jet Express. The one limitation of Jet Express is kind of a teaser product, and it only allows you to report out on the general ledger. It won't allow you to do any of the complex reporting that you may want to do on some of the ledger sub ledgers to say, okay, I want to slice and dice based on customer location or dimension values on the sub ledger. It'll only allow you to do GL reporting. But you can, we have clients who produce their financial statements uh, using Jet Express and the, the GL function within uh, Jet Express. So there are tools that should be available to you if you're already on a newer version of NAV uh, without putting a hefty investment uh, into licensing or anything like that. Uh, but if you, if you want some of the more complex, some of the dashboarding, that type of thing, those can be built with a product like Jet uh, Essentials. Uh, it's just making that initial investment, paying your annual maintenance and getting some training on the product. But I, I think a lot of our clients are self-sufficient on um, Jet Essentials and they're producing reports for themselves uh, after they implement it. Are there any other questions that you guys have? Uh, Blair, we have a few other questions in the Q&A area here. Um, so, do you want me to run through a couple of those with you? Sure. All right. Um, sometimes our aged AP report does not agree with a detailed vendor trial balance. Why does this happen? Uh, without getting into the, the details of uh, of, of each of those uh, items. But one thing you might want to also um, take a peek at is have any reports or any areas in your application being, being customized? And I should have mentioned this at the very beginning of the presentation. Um, if you're working with a client, we see that sometimes the posting routine um, become uh, customized for whatever reason. There could be discrepancies in reports uh, or uh, there could be discrepancies in what's posted to the to a, a, an invoice or to a posting group versus what happens in the GL account. But uh, if, if those two aren't balancing right now, uh, I would start digging into into um, the GL to see exactly what's uh, being posted within there. Uh, is the direct posting turned off for those? And start to dig into the details of each of those uh, particular items. And uh, if a single vendor has invoices belonging to multiple APGLs, do you need to create separate vendor IDs? A single vendor has invoices belonging. So, the, the vendor itself will be tied back to your vendor posting group. You could have it going to multiple revenue GLs for their um, expense accounts. So, like it. You could put in like a maybe maybe you're working with a consulting company like Catapult and and we expense back travel to you guys. You might have a travel GL there. You'll have as an expense account, uh, and then you'll have our consulting hours on top of that, and and maybe we charge you a service fee for something else. So you have three different GL accounts on that particular invoice. But when you look back to your payable side of things, Sheila, what'll happen is. Um, they'll all tie back to that payables control account, which will be for maybe because I think, Sheila, that you're probably in the, in the U.S., so maybe you have a, a foreign vendor posting group, which is tied to GL account one, two, three, and those all, all the entries against our Catapult account will go up into the balance that makes that one, two, three account um, for your payable side of things. So your payable foreign vendors payable will have whatever balance, say $1,000 that we've charged you for travel, service fee, and consulting hours, it's going to go into that control account. The expense account is still going to track all of the same uh, uh, breakdown that you would put onto the invoice. So you don't need to have separate vendor IDs. Uh, possibly if you're dealing with maybe different currencies, that type of thing, you might create different vendor IDs. Um, but you wouldn't have to uh, if you're using multiple expense GL accounts uh, on the invoices themselves. All right. Why don't we make a last call for questions here? Um, so uh, 
And, and I guess just as a follow up on that one, uh, Blair uh, Sheila just uh, said it's an AP for GL for it's an AP GL for construction versus an AP GL for normal operating APs. That's the case here. Okay. So, it, it, like, it, if you're looking to have different control accounts to say, okay, this is all of our vendors that we use for construction, but we also happen to use them for some of our operating costs. Um, there's, I, I would still say on the invoices themselves, the expense accounts that are being hit would be the differentiator, not the control account. From the vendor standpoint, I'm just paying this particular vendor uh, X amount of dollars, and I would do the breakdown based off of the different GL accounts. But if for whatever reason you need your, your balance sheet control accounts to be broken up into um, uh, vendor's construction versus vendor's operation, then uh, in theory you would probably have to have two, two vendors to do that. Uh, I, I've never really seen anything where you have to do that, but maybe you have a different, different requirement uh, from that standpoint. Or if you're talking construction, lots of times people, because it, it's going to become a fixed asset that you're going to put into use, uh, it might go into a capital GL account on the invoices, and then you push all of those um, uh, acquisition costs into your final fixed asset. So I, I need to sit down and get a bit more detail of what you're, what you're trying to accomplish with having the, the different GLs and the breakdown, but those are some of the flavors that that I can see uh, or could possibly be coming out of what you're doing. All right. Um, the only question we have left, Blair, and you might have already, feel like you've already covered this enough, but um, the question to explain working dates um, or how do you, uh, where you open the working date box in the role tailored client. Yeah, so in the bottom left-hand corner when you have the role tailored client open, you should see the date, and if you just open up NAV today, it should be today's date uh, or the computer's date that you're working on. So in the bottom left-hand corner, if you click on that work date or on that date, it should pop up a dialog box that says work date on there, and you put in your new working date. All right. Uh, I just want to remind folks, we have a, a quick survey that will pop up after the session ends. You should see that after you close out. It's just a couple questions. It takes us 15 to 20 seconds to do, and we really appreciate that feedback. Our speakers always do as well. Uh, so if you can look for that uh, after we conclude today. Uh, we'll, we'll start wrapping up, though. So, uh, Blair, thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to speak with us today. All right. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's been fun. Thanks for all the great questions from the audience and for your attention today. Uh, please do look for this uh, session to go on demand soon. We did record it. And um, with that, we will wrap things up. Have a great day.